But what I find really striking is, in Australia, we had an open debate. We had um, delegates elected directly by the voters at the second convention held in 1897-98 um, in each of the states, um, except for Queensland that didn't go. And, and the convention was held publicly. There was a Hansard record of the debates, but the statesmen who led the process of federating recognised we need to take the full picture to the people and convince the people on the merits of the case that this was the appropriate model to federate on. My guest today, Nicholas Aroni, is Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Queensland. He's held visiting positions at Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, Edinburgh and Sydney. Professor Aroni has published over 150 journal articles, book chapters and books in the field of constitutional law, comparative constitutional law and legal theory. In 2017, he was appointed by then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who had declared that important as he believed same-sex marriage was, religious freedom was even more important and critical to the nation, to an expert panel to advise on whether Australian law adequately protects the human right to freedom of religion or, to put it another way, conscience and belief. But of late, he's been researching the much discussed proposal for an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Uh, we'll be talking about that today, but more in the context of trying to unpack what is a constitution, how did we get ours, how important is it, what's involved in changing it, so that hopefully this will be educative, regardless of where people might sit on this particular issue on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, Nick, uh, I've known you a long time. It's great to be here in Queensland with you, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Real pleasure to be here, John. Can we get into it? The idea of a voice to Parliament, uh, but before we come to that, more generally, our constitution and the effect it has on Australia. I think if you said to people in the street, what is the constitution, the, the typical answer would be something along the lines of, well, it's the rule book. It's the playbook by which we are have our rights defined and limited uh, and what have you. Uh, but they wouldn't know too much about the detail. I don't think it's taught very much. Mm. You teach it. I suspect it's not taught much at all. Now, Australia is one of the world's oldest, most stable, and for that matter, most prosperous democracies. Not a bad place to live in, even though we seem to want to knock it a fair bit these days. What role, there's a lot of factors, but what role has the constitution, including the build-up to putting it together by our forebears, played in Australia being the society and the country that it is today? Yeah. Big question, but... It is a big question, and it's a really important one, because one of the first things I say to my students is to put the constitution into perspective, that in a very real sense, constitutions are only as successful as the culture in which they're embedded enables them to be because you can have the finest constitution in the world with all of the right words in it, but if the people operating under it and the political culture in which it operates doesn't have respect for the rule of law, doesn't have respect for following proper procedures, then people will manipulate the document to achieve their own ends and it won't have much effect on controlling government and keeping it under the rule of law. So I think our constitution's been very effective because it has operated by and large, in a society and in, in a culture that does have respect for the rule of law. Um, I think members of parliament and our, and our governments and our courts generally see the value in having uh, an established system of government and following the rules and accepting the verdict of the people at election time and following the proper procedures when making laws and even deliberating about government policy. And it's because of that interrelationship between culture, as it were, and character even, and the constitution that it's been a success. One of the things I always point out to my students is that our constitution requires all of our members of parliament, all of our ministers of government, all of our judges to take an oath, to take an oath to uphold the law. And 
that underscores the importance that each individual that holds office under the Constitution needs to be personally committed to following the rules of the Constitution. And uh, it's only when people do follow through with that commitment because of that oath that they've taken that, that you get that relationship between the people and the Constitution, as it were. And so the Constitution, our Constitution, doesn't try and do too much either. It sets out fundamental rules about how parliaments are formed and how governments are formed and the courts and so on. And some people are critical of our constitution and say it's just procedural and it's just technical and formal. But it's those procedural and technical and formal features of the constitution that um, enable the system to work well, given the proper culture in which it operates. Um, I think a lot of thought was put into the making of the constitution. A lot of people don't appreciate just how much thought went into it. The framers of the Constitution, when they were deliberating about it in the 1890s, read all of the books that were there to be read, at least in the English-speaking world, on what good governance looks like and what good constitutions look like. And they, they looked really closely at the way other constitutions operate in other countries, the United States, Canada, um, the United Kingdom. They also had all of their experiences at a um, colonial level because they were representatives of the six self-governing colonies in Australia. And so they had a lot of experience of what it meant to have constitutional government and representative democracy. And they brought all of this learning into the process of constitution making. And so I think a lot of, because I suppose many students at school are not taught this background, we don't really have an appreciation for the thought that went into it. And so a lot of people will tell you more about, say, George Washington or James Madison or Alexander Hamilton um, as art architects of the US Constitution and not really know about Samuel Griffith, right, or Edmund Barton or um, other, other important figures who drafted the Australian Constitution just as intelligent, just as capable and just as thoughtful as well. Can you fill us in a bit on what might be called their worldview, how they saw if you like, the citizens of Australia at the time and into the future. And the reason I ask that question is that one of my guests shortly, a little while ago said to me, very interesting to see that the Western and successful democracies have been utterly realistic about human nature, whereas the uh, revolutionary doctrines, the French Revolution, the Marxist revolutions in Russia and China and other words, very utopian. You know, if we just get the structures right, everybody will behave perfectly and we'll have free societies. Well, Russia had a brilliant constitution. Nobody took any notice of it. The framers of the British and American approaches, and I think probably the Australian ones, much more realistic, as one American put it, we're so good we had to give ourselves a vote. We're so bad we had to give ourselves a vote. There's this sort of tension that recognises everyone should have a say, but we need a peaceful means for altering course. Mm and you break power up, you limit it, no one can have it for too long. That's right. That's right. I, the framers of the Constitution were very aware of what had been said about the American Constitution because the Americans had um, three of the very important figures, um, particularly James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, wrote a series of papers that we know now as the Federalist Papers. Federalist papers. And they set out a very sophisticated account of what a constitution is, what can it achieve, what should it do. And the Australians read those documents and they thought really deeply about the same sorts of questions, a recognition that you need to create institutions that will enable governance to occur efficiently and effectively, but at the same time design the institutions so that there are checks and balances between them, so that there's a degree of separation of power and a division of power so that it doesn't become too consolidated. One of the South Australian delegates expressed concern that over-centralisation creates he put it, a vortex into which power gets concentrated. And uh, when that happens, people lose liberty because they, the government becomes very distant from them. And uh, once it becomes distant and becomes centralised and concentrated, the capacity of the people to um, influence the government and even resist when it's overreaching becomes weaker. And so the federal system is really important in our, in our system because it, it, enable, it diversifies power. Do you think he was right? I think he was right. Yeah, I think he was right. Yeah, I think I think he was correct about that. You do need to strike the right balance between creating institutions that can be effective, but ensuring that they don't become so effective that they become too powerful and therefore start to trample on people's rights and liberties. 
Is this a, comp a concept of su subsidiarity? Yeah, it is. It is. So the principle of subsidiarity is the idea that in terms of making decisions or in terms of organising oneself and achieving things in life, it's usually best that the smallest institutions do it themselves. So it sort of suggests that families should be free to be families in the best way that they can. And larger institutions shouldn't try and supplant them, but just support them to be what they are. And the same thing can apply to local governments, state governments and federal governments, that the federal government is there to do what the states can't. And you could even push it and say that the states are there to do what localities can't. And local governments and state governments are there to do what families or local communities can't do. It's a question of just understanding a sense of priority. Because when things are done at a local level, people can engage in their own self-government. And when people engage in their own self-government, they usually do it better. It's better for them. And it trains them to be able to perform perhaps the harder tasks of governing at a larger scale. So our, our, our constitution is very much about scale. It's no coincidence that of all of the large countries in the world, both territorially and by population, are federations. The United States, Canada, you have to even say Russia, um, India as well, and Australia. And the one exception, notably, is China. And one of the things about totalitarian governments or authoritarian governments is they don't like federalism because it breaks up power. Um, one of the very interesting observations is that one of the first things that Adolf Hitler did when he came to power in Germany was he effectively abolished the power of the German states, the lender, so that he could concentrate power into his, his hands. Um, so federalism diversifies power. And like for a continent like Australia, you can't really just govern everything from Canberra. You need local state governments to respond to the particular situations that people find themselves across such a vast continent. Interesting, you know, I run into a lot of people when we need to explore it. No, I say we're over-governed, we should do yeah. away with one level. That was the Whitlam argument, which yeah. is interesting in itself. But let's let's have another go at this. This is really interesting to my way of thinking. I recently talked to Oz Guinness and he uh, in one of these programs, and he referred to something that I remember being taught at school and at university, you know, uh, Lincoln talking about democracy being government of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah. Neat little summary, hangs yeah. together, yeah. drives the point. Oz Guinness made the point that it, he was actually indirectly quoting John Wycliffe at Oxford yeah. in the 14th century. And Wycliffe was um, a theologian, as I understand it. And his point was that we need to be good citizens who can govern our own lives and our own small platoon, yeah. family, mm. positive role in the local community. We'll then be citizens who are able to feed a sensible attitude into government and keep it downstream, i.e., I think you used the word about the Constitution, yeah. under control. Yeah. But that's been lost. This idea that a democracy sets up rules, I'm not trying to put a word in your mouth, I'm testing out what I, yeah. as I understand to be the case. The Constitution is designed to ensure that a good and noble citizenry exercising responsibility mm. will be equipped and empowered to ensure government responds to them, yeah. they're not required to respond to government. I think that's true, and it, it reflects also another thing that we could be concerned about, and that is when we start to see ourselves as citizens as merely electors that decide on a government once every three or four years, and then we just expect the government to run itself and to deliver what we want, and then we, you know, three or four years later, decide whether we're happy with it or not as opposed to a much more um, participatory view about what the role is to be a citizen. And it seems to me that you can only really participate effectively, goes back to the local level, because it's very hard for anybody to just launch into um, being a, an effective citizen or engaged in civic affairs at a national level. Very few of us have got that capacity or the time or opportunity, but all of us have an opportunity to try and work and make our family better, our neighbourhood better. Um, our local community better, um, the place where we work, a better place to work. And it's that sort of an attitude and an outlook that builds the foundation for good citizenship at those, those wider levels. Well, to feed then uh, from that into the current debate, uh, there is a proposal that there ought to be 
and I'm not trying to be cute here, something called a voice. It hasn't been well enough defined for people to really know what it is. That's one of the problems. To the parliament. Mm. And the idea is that um, Aboriginal people and a certain proportion, and we need to be careful here because of many Aboriginal people, many Aboriginal Australians are doing very well. You know, they've gone out, got an education, created their family environment, and they've, like so many other Australians, I suspect just happy with their lot. We need to remember that. But there are horror stories out there and they are really distressing. And every, you know, Australians rightly have goodwill. They want to do something about it. But the idea of the voice, the first thing I would say about it is you've just hit on something that I think is very important, so subsidiarity, the idea that your responsibility starts with your taking control of yourself, accepting responsibility for your own actions and seeking to do so in your family school context, sporting team complex, local government and so forth, outwards, a sort of ripple effect. Yeah. And, and one of the things that strikes me, because I represented a lot of Aboriginal people over a lot of time and visited quite a few remote communities, is that in fact uh, the idea of, of small clusters of people taking responsibility for their own future is a very important one because in fact, I've always said there are about 300 Aboriginal nations. In fact, Aboriginal people say it was about 600. Mm. And I look at the area that I used to represent, I can think of one town quite small, 3,000 people, and there are three very distinct nations or sub-nations there. I think of another with four. They're quite small communities. Mm. And I would have thought we've got to find a grassroots up way rather than a tops down way to empower them to exercise that sort of authority over their own lives. Yeah, yeah, I would hope so too. I, I, I tend to see it that way too. I think one of the interesting things, and it's a broader point, but it relates to this, is that because we've forgotten our own history, we don't appreciate that what we know as modern European nations really were birthed in an older historical context where you had very similar local communities operating across continental Europe. You had many tribes, you had many families, you had many clans. And it was only over the process of many hundreds of years that this more tribal, if you like, way of organising yourself, which was characteristic of you know, most humans everywhere, including in Europe, gradually evolved into what we know as modern nation states in Europe. And I think sometimes when we think of I'm not only thinking of Australia, but any country in the world, we, we ask, we say that we might be able to give a constitution to a society and say, here's a modern constitution, run yourself according to this, and it should work. And we don't really appreciate that the modern constitutions that the European nations developed is a consequence of, a, of many hundreds of years of evolution and cultural development. And uh, it's just unrealistic to expect that you can just make a constitution and change a society in that way. I did, I did a study with a colleague on um, the constitution of Fiji. And, you know, the fascinating thing about a country like that is the way in which you have a, a constitution overlaid on top of a culture, a culture that's much more traditional. And the, the gap between the constitution and the underlying culture always makes the country susceptible to the coups and revolutions that they've suffered so many times. And we interviewed a lot of um, Indigenous and Indian Fijians and they were all really concerned about their country and they could see this sense of gap between the constitution and the culture. And I think it's the same with politics as well um, in the sense that for, I would say, for any group of people in Australia, Indigenous or recent migrants, I come from recent migrant stock myself, it all does depend on what we do internally as a community about how we build ourselves as a community and... Um, one can only, you know, hope that each community can build itself into, you know, healthy relationships, healthy economic activity, um, bringing up families in a healthy sort of way for the benefit of the community, the particular community, but also all of the people um, in, in the whole wider society of which they were a part as well. Recognising this really important point that you've just raised, Western cultures developed constitutions over a long period of time. They're based essentially on the idea of the selection and removal of people to lead at the point of a pencil, a vote, mm. whereas many Aboriginal communities are much more traditionally based. The power structures are based around kinship. Mm. And so maybe that reinforces your point. 
that you can't ask them to immediately pick up the idea of constitutional recognition by the vote. You know, uh, as one Aboriginal in the inland made the comment, um, um, you don't vote for the Queen. And he was actually referring to himself, not as a Queen, but he was saying, my position's hereditary and my people respect my position. I'm not going to put my hand up to be a, a, for an elected position. Mm. And when you ask my people to do that, they'll often choose you know, the used car salesman right. rather than the real leaders because the real leaders won't participate. And maybe the voice, to be fair, is an attempt for people to try and come to grips with that, those differences. Yeah. Can you, what is the voice as you understand yeah. and perceive it to be? Yeah. I shouldn't prejudice it too much by saying I'm frustrated because I don't know yeah. exactly what it is yeah. from what we've been told. Yeah, and I do think it's trying to, the proposals are trying to negotiate this issue uh, because what's being proposed in the voice as far as the referenda proposal that the Prime Minister has presented to the Australian people is to establish a body of in, that is representative of Australia's Indigenous peoples that will make representations to the Parliament and to the Executive Government to make representations on matters that relate to laws or policies that affect Indigenous people. Uh, look, and in principle, that's a very worthy thing because laws and, and policies that affect people should have input from the people whom they affect. Isn't that what the Constitution is meant to mean for it every is. Australian, though? Precisely. It, it, it truly is. Um, and, and so the interesting thing about that is that what is being proposed in the Constitution just speaks of a voice. But... Um, and a lot of people say, look, there's not enough detail that's been provided around that. Um, Professor Langton and Tom Calmer have written a, a report, and it's quite a lengthy report. It goes into a lot of detail about what the voice would mean. And they propose that there really should be three layers of the voice. There should be a national voice. There should be 35 regional voices and many, many local voices to give those local communities of which you were speaking an opportunity to make representations themselves. Um, and at a certain level, that makes, sort of makes sense in our, in our country, given the localities that we have, the regions and the states that we have, and the national government that we have. And um, it seems to me that the, the strongest argument for the voice is really thinking of those local communities. The question is whether it's going to be an effective method by which truly local opinion and truly local communities are really going to be able to um, have some sort of effective say on the policies that affect them or not. Now, that's a question that, I mean, the Australian people are going to have to debate and discuss. And I, I have to say up front, I think they're entitled to a lot more detail. They ought to know exactly what this is, especially before they're invited to embed it. But let's make the point first that every Australian is entitled to a voice and every Australian is entitled to club to others, with, together with others, That's to right. magnify their voice. That's right. That's what the National Farmers Federation does. I'm a farmer. You know, it's good that we can come together, magnify our voice, put a position to Parliament. You could say the same of the Country Women's Association, which has done an admirable job in so many ways for such a long time. Right. Every uh, professional association you could think of expects to have a say. That's not at issue. Hmm. It's worth exploring the history of this a bit, though. The reality is that we have many have had quite a few Aboriginal conferences, if you like, where they've tried to come together to present a view. In fact, you could argue there have been six or seven of them. They've not been guaranteed to be locked into place forever in the Constitution, far from it. The last one was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, and it was disbanded by the government that I was part of, with the support of the Labor Party because it was an abysmal failure and it was being led by people who were behaving very, very badly. Mm. So I think the question out of that is that surely it's important that we see precisely what is proposed here and actually pilot it mm. before we were to think about guaranteeing its survival in perpetuity. Yeah. It could certainly be introduced by legislation. I mean, I think when we think about it in a systematic way, there are three ways this can happen. One can come about through self-organisation. And I think that's what you were alluding to at the beginning, that, you know, the Farmers' Federation or Trade Union um, or any other group 
um, of Australian citizens who have a certain identity or common set of interests can organise and self-organise to represent themselves and make representations. And I think an argument could be made that they are the most effective because it's not like it, 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 it involves the initiative of the people involved. They put the work into organising. They put their effort into having an impact. Uh, and it's a very different thing to set up by legislation or by the constitution a set of bodies to enable a certain group to have a say in the governance of the country. It, it has a different effect on the way in which that group will operate. Um, and so I think one of the questions that really needs to be asked is, is it better to be self-organised or to have government organise you? I think that's a very important question here. Um, and then even if it is to be a government sort of um, organisation, you're saying, and I, and I agree, that there are two different ways you can approach it. You can set up legislation and, as it were, pilot the system and see how it operates and see whether it's successful and tinker at it. Um, and then the third alternative is that you can try to put it into the constitution, which is being proposed. Um, I, I tend to think that the reason why it's being proposed constitutionally is due to a path dependency and not simply a reflection on what would be the best way to achieve these objectives. Because for the last three decades or so, there's been debate about how to recognise Indigenous people in the constitution. Uh, it's been proposed that they be recognised in the preamble. Uh, there was a referendum to introduce a new preamble in 1999, um, but that failed. And then some people said, understandably, Indigenous people said, look, a preamble would be merely symbolic, it wouldn't change things, and that's not really adequate. Um, a second sort of proposal was to change the way the Constitution empowers the Federal Parliament to legislate, because it does have a power in the Constitution to make special laws for the people of any particular race it's deemed necessary to make laws for, including Indigenous people. And there's a lot of federal legislation that relies on that head of legislative power to make those laws. And so there were proposals about whether that should be changed to make sure that it could only be used for the benefit of the people of a particular race and not to repress them or to, um, suppress them or oppress them. Um, and alternatively, it was, it was thought perhaps some, the constitution needs to be changed to put in a right that would prevent the parliament from making a law that was discriminatory on the basis of race. But the concern that was expressed about that is that it would enable the judges unelected to um, make judgments about legislation passed by a democratically elected legislature about whether this really was beneficial and discrimi or discriminatory or not. Uh, and so... That, in a sense, lost way and people thought that's not the appropriate way to recognise Indigenous people. And so the question is, well, how should they be recognised? A sort of sense that they should be, but how? And this is where the voice idea came up, that this would be an, another way to recognise Indigenous people by giving them, as it said, a voice. Uh, but I think it's because of that path dependency, that, that question, we want to recognise Indigenous people, we need to find some way to do it that the voice is being proposed for the constitution. Whereas I think if we had resolved the question of recognition in the constitution, say we had put something in the preamble and say people had been become settled about that, that that was an appropriate thing to do, then the debate about the voice might not have been so constitutional and it might have been more about asking how can Indigenous people have a say in their own self-governance and it would go back to those first two ways of approaching it rather than the constitutional one. That's, uh, well, that's a very interesting set of insights there. Let's uh, just park for a moment a further question or two about the constitution mm. and talk about the, the, the Uluru statement from yeah. the heart. Yes. What's the relationship between the proposed voice and the Uluru statement from the heart? What is it? And keep in mind that the Prime Minister says he committed to it in full. Yeah. So the... the Uluru Statement from the Heart is the document that expresses this desire for an Indigenous voice to be recognised in the Constitution and established by the Constitution. Um, but it's a more complex document than that. It, it is a document prepared by um, a large group of people representing Indigenous peoples 
of Australia. And it expresses um, a desire to have recognised not just a voice, but the Indigenous nations themselves and their traditional connection with the land of Australia and even speaks in the language of sovereignty, the sovereignty of those Indigenous peoples over these lands and speaks of the calls for um, a coming together um, of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and a, and a process whereby a treaty or treaties would be negotiated between Indigenous nations and the Australian governments. So is it one treaty or is it 600 treaties or somewhere in between? It's a very good question because there are, as you say, so many different Indigenous communities, each of them in one sense a separate nation, and um, so many different governments in Australia as well. So it's an open question around exactly how many treaties that would that idea would, would lead to. Um, and so in the Uluru Statement, the Indigenous voice is seen as the first step towards establishing those treaties as well. So if the proposal were to be carried at a referendum, and we don't know the, the answer to that, it might not be. If it was, and if legislation was enacted to establish the voice, one would expect that there would be many Indigenous people that would be pressing that the first item on the agenda would be a treaty. The Prime Minister has said he commits in full. Yeah. So we need to be absolutely clear the Prime Minister's intent is that we should move to a treaty, or treaties plural, and it's another area where, with respect, I just have to say, we do not know what the proposal might look like. Mm. We don't know whether it would lead to endless disagreements between Aboriginal people because I've seen so much of that. Mm. Yeah. I've seen so much of it. And it's a tragedy because it holds them back. It doesn't advance anybody. That's right. We don't know whether it would lead to calls for reparations because it has in other parts of the world. Um, and one aspect of it is that they've never ceded, uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart says, um, sovereignty, meaning it was never recognised because it wasn't. Uh, I think that's fair to say. And they feel they've never ceded it. But what in their mind do they mean by sovereignty? Yeah. It, it's not fully defined in the Uluru Statement. Um, there are words to this effect that it's, it's, it's a spiritual notion. And what does that mean? I think it's a reflection or a, an allusion to Indigenous understandings of the relationship between those Indigenous nations and the land itself, which I'm really not competent to explain or even understand in any, at any length myself. Uh, and it's interesting, the use of the word sovereignty, because in, in Western and European and even international context, the word sovereignty is a term that's used to designate the authority of a nation state. And those nation states um, are the only entities at international law that can enter into treaties. So there's a very close relationship at international law between sovereignty and treaty. Um, However, when one speaks of, say, Indigenous sovereignty as a concept or an Indigenous treaty as a concept, the question is, are you talking about treaty and sovereignty in the same sense? Or are you talking about it in what might be called a more domestic sense? Um, and what is the relationship then between that, it's that sovereignty and that treaty to the constitution itself? And I suspect that that's what drives some debate within Indigenous people, among Indigenous peoples, about whether the voice should come first and then a treaty, or whether a treaty should come first and then the voice. Because if you put the voice into the constitution, it is a recognition that it has to be put into the constitution. It's not the other way around, that the treaty is the framework within which the constitution's understood, it, and then the voice is understood. It's rather that the constitution is the context in which the voice is understood. And I, I, I've, I suspect that that is one of the driving reasons for that debate amongst Indigenous people about whether to support the voice or not, um, and whether a, a treaty should be the pathway or whether the voice should be the pathway. See, my great fear is that the idea of a treaty would be driven by elites purporting to represent Aboriginal people, whereas in reality, they are, this is not to denigrate Aboriginal people in their communities at all. They were very diverse. And in some ways to not respect that diverse, A, will lead to strife, but B, could be very disrespectful to a lot of smaller communities. So in a practical sense, I'm deeply worried by that, that problem. 
and, and it seems to me too that depending on the nature of the treaty, what you'd be doing, what, what many people would be doing would be signing something that said we're an autonomous people at the same time as in fact, to be utterly realistic about it now, we can't live as islands in, in this country, Australia. We are Australians together. So a needy Aboriginal community that is heavily dependent upon the support of the broader Australian taxpayer, how does it work for them to have an independent treaty and establish their own national sovereignty? Does it indicate a desire to withdraw altogether and have their own lifestyle and substitute for the normal systems of governments and commerce that we have? These things are not being explained or explored in any way that's meaningful to the Australian people. Yeah. One of the things that I, I often observe, I'm, I'm very attentive to in constitutional law, is when the singular is used and when the plural is used. Right. Uh, because it makes a big difference to say that, say, the United States, united plural states, that would be an example. And it's interesting that our parliament, the first house of our parliament, is called the House of Representatives in the plural which underscores this idea that it's a singular house, mm. but it consists of a plurality of representatives right, that's what you're saying. of yep. many localities yep. and doesn't imply that it has a singularity of will right. in terms of its underlying composition. Certainly there are voting systems, the voting system within then concentrates that towards um, a, a position that the majority support by way of legislation. Whereas, and, and so it is, it is interesting to me that the expression to be proposed to put in the constitution is the indigenous voice in the singular. Um, although the reports are suggesting that there would be many voices in the plural. Um, but one has always to reflect on the fact that such is human nature in any organisation, that there are always many voices and always many opinions at stake. And so the question will always be as a matter of politics. Like politics will inhabit the voice. Absolutely. And there will be differences of opinion. And, mm. and so if it is established, uh, there would be differences of opinion. You might say healthy differences of opinion. Um, but one shouldn't then make the mistake of thinking of it as being in the singular other than as a result of voting within the decision-making processes. And so that's a point of detail that's very relevant is for any organisation, any institution that makes decisions, what are its decision-making rules? because those decision-making rules shape the dynamics of the, of the institution. So if, it, if the system requires a simple majority vote on the House, in the House, then you know that it's that 50% plus one that putting aside the Speaker's casting vote will determine the outcome. But in some decisions we say there must be an absolute majority, which is a majority of all the people entitled to vote, not just everybody who happens to turn up. And then on some issues we say we want even higher proportions of votes because we think we need a larger consensus. At least some constitutions yes. do that. And why do they do that? Because in, on some issues they feel like you need wider consensus in decision making. Is, is that just to interrupt for a moment? Yeah. Surely that's reflected in the fact that in Australia to win or change the constitution you have to have a, a majority of yes. people in a majority of states. That's right. So it's not just a simple majority of the Australian right. people. That's right. You need a higher test for fear of upsetting national harmony. Is that, that's the thinking, is yeah, it? Yeah, and to recognise that each of the states entered the Federation as an independent, self-governing community and so is respected as mm. such, even in the process whereby the constitution could be changed. Um, and it effectively means that uh, you need majorities in four of the Australian states in order to change the constitution, which will apply to the referendum proposal uh, as well. And so the question would be, how will decisions be made in the Indigenous voice, noticing that there are many voices and many representatives, both at a national level, regional, and even a local level? And that picks up the point that you were making, that um, because we're speaking of um, a degree to which it's giving voice to uh, Indigenous people who live by Indigenous traditions, those traditions themselves, which could vary from one locality to another to an extent, are going to shape the way the voice will operate. Um, and so some thought needs to be given to understanding that so that Australian voters know what that might mean uh, in practice. And um, I, I don't know that that's fully has been discussed. In the, in the report by Professor Langton and Tom Calmer, there is some discussion of uh, the idea that the composition of the local 
uh, voices would be based on communal sort of ideas and not necessarily simply on voting in the way that I suppose we're accustomed to in terms of the Australian political system and electoral system where each individual has a vote and we count the votes and the majority determines who gets elected to the parliament. So there'll be questions, a lot of questions of detail about exactly how that works and whether each small voice decides for itself. But that always, there's always a chicken and an egg question there about, you know, you say, okay, this organisation will decide for itself how it will make its decisions. But you have to make a decision about how you're going to make the decision in the first place. And so this is where another type of path dependency always kicks in. The decisions that are made um, right at the beginning of the establishment of an institution really lay down the rules that will shape the way it can develop in the future. If you, if you say that we're going to make decisions by consensus right from the beginning, then you sort of lock in that expectation and requirement of consensus for decision making going forward. Whereas if you set the bar lower and say, we're just going to have a simple majority make decisions, it makes the organisation much easier, much easier for the organisation to make the decision. But then what it means is that 50% plus one can always get their way and the 49% will always lose. Or at large, large minorities can sometimes just get um, worked out of the process and not genuinely represented in the in the process. And uh, we sense that you need both in some sense in a, in a good operating system. You need majorities to make decisive decisions, but then you need wider consensus to maintain that wider support in the community and not have large minorities excluded from the decision-making process or effectively not getting their way. And that applies politically to the system as a whole in Australia, but it will apply to the voice at all of these levels. That sort of sorting out of human decision-making is going to have to occur. But that, for me, everything you've just said, I understand, but it raises the reality. We haven't been told enough to have an informed debate about how to work. And I just noticed the other day a quite fascinating remark from former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who was, when Prime Minister strongly opposed, said this will be a third chamber in the parliament, as now one senses reluctantly saying he'd support it. But he said this only a couple of weeks ago. So I think the government is sort of stuck with the position they're in and there's a very sincere, calculated, intelligent, informed view among the yes campaign that the more detail you have, the more likely it is that it'll go down. I have an immense problem with that. That is to effectively say that you should not allow the punters to have too much information about this because uh, it's not what they think it is. Mm. Yeah. And they'll vote against it. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's memories of what happened with the Republic referendum that may even be affecting Mr Turnbull, but or anybody asking, you know, how do you get a constitutional referendum up? I think there's this view that could be taken that the Republic referendum failed because there was so much detail and because people knew exactly what was being proposed and could see how it would work and you had a divided electorate between three groups. You had the monarchists on one hand who just didn't want a republic. You had those who wanted a republic where you would directly elect the president and you had a more minimal republic that would maintain our parliamentary system and just really have um, some sort of a head of state who wasn't the queen but was an Australian operating. And but that split the vote three ways. But part of the issue lay in the fact that these were very well worked out models. People could understand very specifically what they meant and um, enough people didn't like the model that was being proposed in all of its detail. And so people reflecting on that said, you know, going forward, if they were Republican, um, if they wanted to see a republic come up, they were proposing that the first question should be asked, do you want a republic without details? To try to yes. establish the principle that a majority want a republic and then debate the detail about what sort of republic. Now, I think there's a similar line of reasoning occurring with the voice, the idea being get in principle support for the voice from a majority and then debate the details. Now, you can understand why people who want the voice will think that that is going to be an effective means to achieve the goal. But what I find really striking is, having studied really closely the making of the Australian Constitution, was the detail to which the framers of the Constitution went. Like, 
we, we often talk about the American making the American Constitution as a wonderful example, but the convention at Philadelphia was held behind closed doors and the delegates were sworn to secrecy and the public didn't know what they were debating or arguing. It was only later that it was all revealed what they were saying amongst themselves. Whereas in Australia, we had an open debate. We had um, delegates elected directly by the voters at the second convention held in 1897-98 um, in each of the states, um, except for Queensland that didn't go. And, and the convention was held publicly. There was a Hansard record of the debates and the Australian community had this opportunity and the people in the different colonies to know exactly what was being proposed. But the statesmen who led the process of federating recognised we need to take the full picture to the people and convince the people on the merits of the case that this was the appropriate model to federate on. Now, they could have taken the approach of, no, we won't take the detail to the people. We'll just give them a more vague idea about a sort of federation and say, we'll sort out the details. They didn't take that approach. And it's actually one of the reasons why I think our constitution has been so successful, is that it has profoundly deep roots of consensus across the country because it was such an open process and voters in each of the colonies had a say. And yes, there were some points on which they couldn't agree and they left things open. I mean, inevitably, it's a question of degree about how much detail and how much not. But they were prepared to put forward a very detailed model, the entire Constitution Act. See, in Canada, when they made their constitution, really what the people got a chance to vote on was a set of general resolutions that described the general principles. Now, there were 72 resolutions, I think, if I recall correctly. They're quite a lot of detail, but still resolutions. The Australians had the actual act that was going to be enacted by the British Parliament with all of its detail. And so when Australians voted on whether they wanted to federate, they looked at the Act and said, yes or no, we want to federate on that basis. And that deep consensus that was the foundation of the Constitution, going back to your initial question, is one of the deep reasons why I think we've been such a stable democracy. And that's a contrast with what's being proposed here with The Voice, it has to be said. Uh, and, and I should state very, I mean, I think people, many will know that my position is that we should be extraordinarily reluctant to change the constitution. It should be totally blind to where you live in Australia, your gender, your age, your wealth, your position in the land, or the colour of your skin. Mm. So to put it there, that's that's I have a real problem there. And in as much as there are a couple of very modest race-based provisions in the constitution now, I personally would rather we had perhaps even a new con constitutional convention of some sort and sought to remove them mm. because I just think critical to the principle of a really flourishing democracy is that we are obliged to fully recognise the equal equality of all Australians. No one's above the law, no one's below it, no one's left behind in the constitution, mm. no one has a privileged position. Mm. So I'm not against recognition, but that's where I come from constitutionally. Yeah. Tell us what, in your view, would be the machinery of changing the constitution here because that's sounding incredibly complicated. That even if you got approval from the Australian people to change the constitution, you've got the exhaustive business then of designing the model and then making it work. Can you work us through the machinery of how that might happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, to begin with, in terms of amending the, I could separate it into the making, amending the constitution and then the legislative framework, which I think was the more focus of your question. But, you know, just to underscore, any proposal to change the constitution has to be passed by the parliament in the first place. And then it has to be put to the people in a referendum. And you need to get the support of a majority of voters across Australia, as well as a majority of voters in a majority of states. And if you get that success at the referendum, then by force of that process, it will enter into, it'll be put into the constitution. Uh, but then the second part of your question is, well, what would be the legislative process? And all I can say is that it would be the ordinary process of lawmaking. So that means that <clears throat> parliamentary council or perhaps a special committee or perhaps um, even an external committee could be formed to come up with draft ideas about exactly what it would look like. You wonder what processes of consultation would go on through that process. 
um, in terms of the detail, um, the legislative detail for establishing the voices, because it is a pl probably is going to be a plurality of voices, and then that has to go back to the parliament and has to be passed by both houses of the parliament. And so it itself will be subject to the normal vicissitudes of parliamentary debate. And we know that you know, the House of Representatives has a very different political complexion to the Senate. And you know, a law ordinarily has to be passed by both houses unless there's a prolonged deadlock between them. And there are processes or procedures rarely used to try and break the deadlock. So, which lock the country up in gridlock can do from time to time. Can do. That's right. And the the, the framers of the constitution did put in a, a deadlock breaking mechanism, yeah. but it's only very rarely used, and uh, is very. Oh, I suppose you could say it's cumbersome. It's it's quite time consuming, and it takes the cycle of more than one parliament to achieve. You have to have a, effectively an election in between to get the people to express Design. their view about about the policy or the proposed law. So, yeah, it seems to me that just in, in a very sketchy sort of way, it, the process would involve all of those steps to introduce a new vo a voice or voices. And then once the legislation is enacted, then you have a whole lot of uh, administrative work that would have to be done to, um, to, to, to actually make it happen in practice. Um, you, would, you would probably need a government agency or department to oversee it. You would probably need... To, like the, there's a whole budgetary side to all of this, of course, too, because to what extent will the voice or the voices be received public funding? How, how much will that public funding will be? How will it be determined? Will it be guaranteed? Or will it be subject to constant renewal or reassessment? Those sorts of things. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of detail to be worked out. It's going to be a if, if, it, if it is proposed, it's going to take a long time to actually put it into practice. Can I ask you some of the detail as you perceive it to be that's not settled? One of the biggest issues has emerged, would the voice be to the parliament or to the executive? And the yes camp is giving conflicting answers on that. It seems to me quite apparent that there are those in the yes camp who are saying, yes, it should be able to speak to the executive government. They're saying, others saying, no, that's too far. And the, the subplot seems to be, the subtext is, that will get rejected by the Australian people. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the difference in, in yep. your language as a constitutional lawyer and yep. why does it matter? It's a really important distinction. So what the Prime Minister has proposed in the language that he's presented to the Australian people is that the voice will make representations to both the parliament and the executive government. So that's what is literally on the table at the moment. And there's a lot of debate about that, that very question, as you've pointed out. So the idea of making representations to the parliament as such uh, would, would involve the idea that the voice or the voices would make representations, probably in writing, but there's also the question about whether sometimes representa representations can be made orally as well in meetings or in presentations. But one way or another, and you know, ordinarily probably in writing, uh, to the parliament, and you could imagine that representation would be tabled in parliament and that way become part of the official record of the parliament and every member of parliament would read it and have an opportunity to reflect on it. And if it was a submission about you know, particular proposed legislation or whether it was about a treaty, um, that it would have an impact on that process of deliberation about making laws um, and even about the exercise of executive power. A representation to the executive government is a different thing. The it's very interesting. I, I was very struck the moment I saw the word executive government in the Prime Minister's proposal because that's the phrase that's used to designate the second chapter of the Constitution. Our, our Constitution consists of several chapters, and chapters 1, 2, and 3 deal with the Parliament, the Executive Government, and the Judiciary. So the second chapter is about the Executive Government. And so, therefore, the term Executive Government is a very large concept. Technically, it includes everything from the King to the Governor-General and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet and the Ministers and the government departments and all of the civil servants, that collectively is the executive government. 
One of the interesting and open questions so is not whether the broader it, backbenchers who have no actual role, not, uh, not as such, as no. a cabinet minister or a minister. That's, that's right. That's the, the distinction that, that, that some is, people might not be aware of. Yes, that is an important distinction. Mm. That's exactly right. And but then the interesting question is whether it includes government agencies. Um, statutory agencies, statutory corporations, because in a sense they are arms of the executive in a, in a looser or more diffuse sense, but they're established by legislation. One of the ways in which, and this is to get a little technical, is Chapter 2 is about the executive government and about executive power. And executive power is a technical concept like legislative power. It's the power to administer the law. It's the power to like run a department or administer a policy. It's even the power that the police exercise in their daily duties. It's the, it's the power that uh, any civil servant is exercising when they make a decision about whether you're entitled to an unemployment benefit or not, or all of those sorts of decisions. So the interesting question would be how deep does it go in terms of these agencies? Because there are many, many quasi-government agencies that are established by statute that perform governmental functions or quasi-government functions like the Australian Law Reform Commission, the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Australian Museum, the War Memorial, the, the ABC. Now, I'm not saying that they would necessarily be seen as part of the executive government as ordinarily understood, but they're borderline questions about which I can just foresee um, questions being raised. Isn't this where there's concern about the law mm. interfering you know, these things being justiciable, justiciable. Um, so, for example, uh, Greg Craven on the Yes Committee has said if this isn't properly designed and they have the right to advise, say, the Cabinet or the National Security Committee of Cabinet, plainly part of the executive government, and given that they have a right, yeah. that Cabinet or the National Security Committee would have an obligation to seek the views. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah. So or that, it could be said, it could be mm, tested at law, mm -hmm. and it would be. Yeah. Let's face it, it would be tested. Yeah. And he paints the example of a, 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 of a national emergency, mm. a war, mm. and the need to suddenly declare that such and such an area uh, in the Northern Territory was going to be laid down for an airport mm. to land bombers on or airplanes, yeah. uh, war planes. Yeah. Um, but the emergency is such that... The voice is not consulted. Yes. The voice goes to the High Court. Yes. An injunction is granted when the rest of the country might be screaming, we're in grave danger, uh, and just get on with it in the way that they can now. Mm. Nobody else has any, the ability to stop NSC. Yeah. The Australian electors can throw out the government, yeah. get rid of the NSC at an election, mm. but nobody else would have the right, I wouldn't have thought, or have any real chance of going to the High Court saying, in a national emergency, the NSC has um, been overruled yeah. uh, and, 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 and should be pulled back into line. Yeah. Is this where this, this hub of deep concern about it having a voice to the executive government could almost be limited in terms of the things that, yeah. uh, unlimited in terms of the things that could be taken to the courts? And that doesn't fit with the reassurances that this is only a modest proposal that will not change the way we're governed. Look, I think there's uh, probably three or four points to make to try and answer that question because it's quite complex to un unpack. So one of them is that um, Professor Langton and Tom Calmer have proposed in their report that the, the Indigenous voice would effectively have the, not only the right to make representations but that governments would have a duty to consult with it, yes. particularly when the matter just overwhelmingly and clearly involved Indigenous peoples. So depending on the language of the legislation or depending on the way the High Court interprets even the Constitution, there could be the proposition that there is a duty to consult. Now, what that duty would then involve is an interesting question because there are overseas precedents, not in an Indigenous context, but where governments have duties to consult about what real and proper consultation entails because there's um, cases that have suggested from South Africa and Canada and, and the UK that the, the necessary consultation involves giving the body all of the information it needs in order to make a representation in an informed manner. 
And one of the cases has gone so far as to say that you need to present to the body what you're proposing to do and the reasons for it, the alternatives that you considered and why you haven't chosen them, so that the body can read those and be fully informed when making its representations on those matters. So a, a duty to consult if it was legislated or inferred from the constitutional language to be implied, that would be a longer bow, but either way, then could have those implications. Separate from that is a well-established principle of Australian administrative law, and that is that when an administrative decision maker, that's the executive government, makes a decision, they are under law obliged to take everything that's relevant into consideration, whatever is relevant to that decision. And they're also under an obligation not to take into, into consideration things that are ir irrelevant, strictly so. And a person affected by that decision can initiate legal proceedings when they believe that relevant matters have not been considered or irrelevant matters have been considered. And if they can convince the court that that's the case, the court will order the decision maker to go back and make the decision again and take into consideration what they should have. Uh, and it does seem to me quite likely that uh, a constitutional provision that said that the voice has this function of making representations in and of itself would lead to that inference. And legislation enacting that and putting into effect would further create that inference. And so I think that's why Professor Craven is, is saying what he's saying, is that once you have that principle in play, it would be possible for, um, a, say, a member of the voice or someone representing the voice, as it were, to bring an action in the courts if they believed that government had proceeded without consulting, consulting, um, consulting them or a representation had been made but it hadn't been properly considered. And there's like hundreds, thousands of ordinary decisions of, of our courts putting into that into practice. And I think there's beyond doubt that that sort of principle would apply um, to the voice. Now, whether it would happen in the way that Professor Craven is specifically um, outlining there, perhaps, perhaps not. You know, I could imagine the court taking the view that um, the, the, the very emergency nature of the situation, particularly exercising powers under the defence power, might be seen as exceptional. Uh, but the general principle of this capacity to require decision makers to go back and make the decision again uh, is a well-established principle that I think is clearly going to apply if the voice is carried. So to go back to my proposition, I made the comment that I, I, I really struggle with the idea of inserting anything into the Constitution that provides special benefits to any individual grouping of Australians. To be fair, we need to ask the question, uh, Marcia Langton has said that the Constitution is a racist document. What would be the basis of that claim? Because I've always thought of it as a dry and dusty document that, that is not racist, despite making a couple of modest provisions for the looking after by the Commonwealth, making laws by the Commonwealth for Aboriginal people. On what basis might it be seen as a, cons as a racist document? Yeah. I mean, it, it's partly a complex question, but in another sense, there's a simple answer to it. Um, I think on the face of the document, it's not racist because it doesn't, on the whole, draw distinctions between people on the basis of race and accord special rights to some because of their race or, or place special detriments on people because of their race. It doesn't work that way. It, it presupposes that we all are citizens and that we're equal citizens and therefore we all have an equal opportunity to be involved in politics and um, become members of part or um, nominate for election to parliament or voting in elections and all of those things. So in that sense, it's, it, I don't think it is at all racist. It, it's, it's, it, in that sense, as people sometimes say, it's colour blind. Um, there are some, I mean, there is the race's power. So there's a power to make laws for the people of any particular race. Um, but it, it ha the High Court has come very close to deciding, hasn't actually finally decided, that that can only be used for the benefit of Indigenous people um, or the people of any particular race. I mean, it could be argued that even having that clause in the Constitution is inappropriate because it's it's not quite consistent with that, the that's concept my position, of, of common citizenship. Yeah, it's and my I'm, position that we ought to have a look at those things and, again and, 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 and rework them. Explicitly out. say this that's is right. a completely colourblind. That's right. Completely. 
Totally. So there's another provision in the Constitution that says that um, in situations where people of a particular race um, are excluded from voting, they aren't counted for working out the populations of the different states when working out some of the more mechanical decisions that have to be made about representation and the referendum process under Section 128. And that seems racist in a sense, but actually what it does is it creates an incentive not to exclude people from voting. Because if the state of New South Wales was to exclude the people of a particular race from voting, then its numbers would be reduced by that amount and therefore its representation in the parliament would be reduced by that amount, which would weaken its voice um, in, in the federal parliament. And so even though that on its face looks like it has a racial sort, and it is racial, um, it has that incentive effect of trying to, of undermining racially discriminatory laws when by it comes to... By the states. By the states, yeah. Now, Maybe I, that I, could be cleaned up now too. I think that could definitely be cleaned up. Yeah. Mm. And I, I think it should be. Because I don't think it's necessary and I don't think in principle it's a good thing for the Constitution to be drawing distinctions on the basis of race. And the High Court's been very clear about this and increasingly clear about it, that the Constitution is premised on an idea about universal citizenship for all Australians without distinctions on the basis of sex or race, for example. Um, to move on a little from this then, uh, there are countries that have established treaties, as we know, particularly Canada and New Zealand. There's a couple of questions that arise out of that. Uh, firstly, to observe that in the case of New Zealand, you had a much more recognisable form of government. The treaty that was signed there was not actually with all of the people of New Zealand. That's often overlooked. And it was only possible after the missionaries had set up schools right across New Zealand and a language emerged, an understanding of language and writing emerged so that you can actually write out a constitution, a, 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 a treaty. Mm. Uh, so there are particular circumstances mm. that did not pertain here. That needs to be remembered. Mm. It's not an argument against a treaty so much as to say, try and understand why there wasn't one struck initially. Mm. Mm. There were all sorts of, there were very good reasons why it couldn't be done even if they look unfortunate now in the context of the times, we mm. need to be careful about judging those who went before us. But more generally, what, what constitutional arrangements have been put in place in Canada? Well, firstly, has it amounted to a drift towards co-governance? And secondly, has it been allowed for constitutionally in those two countries? Mm. I think you'd have to ask some specialists about those sorts of questions. I'm not on top of that. In, in a lot of detail. Um, but I think it does tend to move towards co-governance because it provides foundation upon which um, Indigenous peoples um, have, um, in the terms of the treaty or the implications of the treaty, um, establishedly they're recognised as such, as, as governing partner, partners in government. Um, and in fact, some of the Australian reports have proposed that the voice itself would involve a sort of model of co-governance in a certain sort of sense of the word, when it when the when the subject matter of government policy was the indigenous affairs, in some way um, or another, um, what's actually interesting is I, I've argued that the reason one of the reasons why New Zealand never joined the Australian Federation was that treaty, because when the Australian colonies were looking at federating. New Zealand was really a real possible um, yes. party to that. Well, they participated in one of the earlier That's constitutional right. conventions. That's right. And a lot of people say, oh, well, it was distance. But Perth was just as far away from the eastern seaboard as, as Auckland was. Um, and one of the thought, things that it really occurs to me when you look really closely at the debates is that New Zealand ha had actually developed more rapidly than the Australian colonies because it wasn't just the significance of the... Um, the treaty wasn't just that the indigenous or the Maori um, entered the treaty, but was that the um, the New Zealand government itself, through the Crown, was able to itself enter into a treaty. None of the Australian colonies had ever entered into any treaties either. They weren't able to do it. So it sort of was about the immaturity or immaturity of both the colonies as well as um, the, the place of the indigenous people um, that sort of shapes these these sorts of things which underscores the extent to which we have to understand these, our constitution in evolutionary terms. In a sense, we've got to understand that 
the constitution evolves very gradually on the basis of the principles that are already established within it. Uh, and that creates, as I've said too many times probably to you, a certain path dependency of, of the way the steps that you take then have knock-on effects going forward. Um, so, I mean, I would even go so far as to say that where the voice is inserted into the constitution will make a difference. Because if it's put into a chapter on its own, it structurally gives it a significance that it wouldn't otherwise have. Because at the moment, we have another institution called the Interstate Commission, referred to in Section 101 of the Constitution, but not in its own chapter. And in quite emphatic terms, there's meant to be a, an Interstate Commission. Doesn't exist, has existed, uh, but it's not in its own chapter. Because when, the, when you look at the chapters of the Constitution, they reflect the important institutions of the Constitution. That's why Chapter 1 is about the Parliament, Chapter 2 is about the Executive Government, and Chapter 3 is about the Courts. And then we have a separate chapter about the States, because they are the four important institutions, as it were. Um, and so when you put um, an institution into its own chapter, you're, you're elevating it to a status that's similar to those other institutions, even if its functions are different. So in, in one sense, going back to a comment you made earlier, you know, would the voice be a fourth chamber, or sorry, a third chamber of the parliament? No, I don't think it would be a third chamber in the strict sense of the word. Because that was Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm Turnbull said that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, I don't think it would be a third chamber in the strict sense of the word because you have the two houses of parliament that have to legislate and the voice is not given legislative power per se. What it's given, though, is an authority to make representations, and that has its own special dynamic. It's a unique capacity, but it's a capacity, and it's capacity different to making laws. It's a capacity different to executing the laws. It's a capacity different to what judges do when they decide disputes, but it still is a function in and of itself that's very significant, that's designed to, if it's approved by the people, shape legislation and shape executive government policy insofar as it relates to Indigenous peoples. So I think that's the best way to try to understand it. And it will be significant if it's proposed that it goes into its own chapter as opposed to a section on its own, because the structure of the constitution is also part of its meaning. And the High Court has said that. That's a very interesting observation you make about a body that's mentioned in the constitution and simply doesn't exist anymore. It's just been allowed to fade out gently. And I don't think anybody's going to go to the High Court and say, bring back the Commission. Not likely to happen. It raises, though, for me, something in my mind that when I was a minister, from time to time, you'd set bodies up and you'd put sunset clauses in or you'd time limit them. Surely the whole objective of The Voice is to ensure that all Aboriginal people enjoy the same opportunities, the same privileges and so forth. And I think that's what the Constitution essentially provides for and should provide for, and no more, no less. Uh, but if it's trying to address disadvantage, surely the idea is to address the disadvantage until it's gone, in which case the voice is no longer needed. And one of the worries I have is you see activists everywhere who will use every lever available, and particularly in a victimhood culture, where they will try and keep people in victimhood. They've almost got an incentive to keep them victims or identified as victims so they can weaponise them in the pursuit of power. And I have a worry that the whole idea of the voice should be that it should in effect achieve its purposes when it's no longer, and then it's no longer needed. It would no longer be needed. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is, it's a very interesting contrast to the Interstate Commission on a couple of counts. I mean, one of the interesting things about the Interstate Commission provisions is they have more detail than is being proposed for the voice. So if you have a look at Section 101, it actually stipulates much more clearly what its composition will be and its powers and its functions in more detail and doesn't leave it to Parliament as much as what is being proposed. Uh, and as you say... I don't think anybody has wanted to bring an action to sort of force the government's hand to have an interstate commission, although it'd be a very interesting thing if anybody ever did, Would if be. they had standing to, to bring the action. The question might be standing. Whereas with an Indigenous voice, it's pretty clear that an Indigenous person probably would have standing to force the hand of the government to introduce legislation, to enact a law, to maintain the voice, so that once you've put it into the constitution, it, it probably will have a permanency to it um, for those reasons. And then the question is, yeah, you're, you're doing it permanently, 
the only way to remove it is another constitutional referendum. Uh, and so the question the Australian people will have to ask is, well, what is the purpose of the voice? And for those who take the view that its purpose is to um, redress the issues that Indigenous people face, to try to ensure that government policy helps Indigenous people to overcome their problems, the problems that exist amongst some Indigenous communities, then the purpose, if that is achieved, that you know the purpose has come to an end. And so, but then the question would be whether other people have other purposes for it. Um, and I, I suppose your observation just picks up something that I that I said before, and that is um, about pluralities and singularities. You know that the expression "the voice" implies one voice, but real politics is always about many contested voices and many different representatives. And so the very nature of the voice is just like the parliament. It's not a, you know, it's, this isn't a knockdown criticism of the voice. It's just an observation about the nature of the parliament as well as the voice. It will be political. Like, will political parties um, seek to influence the voice? And will the voice seek to, well, it obviously will. It, it will obviously do that. But mm. uh, what will happen within the internal politics of the mm. voice as well? To what extent will parties develop or factions or sections, just because like it in should be remembered, that the constitution does not provide for political parties. No, it doesn't. They the, have arisen. That's right. There are there's something of a natural consequence of democratic politics. There's a lot of science, political science literature about discussing that very fascinating thing. But that also goes back to decisions you make about how you design an institution, because. The party system in Australia is very different from in America. It was very different from in Germany. Why? Largely because of the electoral systems and the political system. So that the American system drives towards just two parties that simply dominate. The German system, say, for example, drives to many, many parties that have to form coalitions. The Australian system is somewhere in between where we have a tendency for two parties to dominate but not quite the same as the American where we will have other minor parties that are significant in the mix. So we're somewhere in between the two systems. So one would have to, in terms of the way in which any voice would operate at any of these levels, it would be a function of partly the decision-making processes that they adopt at each level and partly about the underlying culture, traditions, customs that then shape the behaviour within those institutions. And um, I mean, that, that's an open question of about exactly how it will work. But I, my point is how you set up an institution has a large effect on actually how it will operate um, and that you can see systemic effects of certain sorts of decision-making rules have sh shaped the way the politics works within an institution. Finally, something else that's troubling me. Presumably, the references in the constitution to the voice were it to succeed, would not actually specify in the way that the constitution does a lot of other things, who was entitled to be part of the mechanism of the voice. Yeah, yeah. That would be in the legislation. Yeah. But I think it's incredibly important to say, yeah. for Aboriginal people as much as for non-Aboriginal people, yeah. who is represented by the voice. Yeah. Because depending on how it unfolds, mm. you may very well have a lot of people who feel they don't want to be represented by the voice. You might have a lot of people who shouldn't be represented mm -hmm. by the voice but think there might be advantages yeah. in being represented yes. by it. These are all very important questions. I mean, we have very detailed answers to the question, who has the right to vote in Australia? Like we, we have clear rules so that we know who has the right to vote and who doesn't because the integrity of the electoral role and the integrity of the electoral system depends on that clarity. And when you have uh, breaches of those principles in one way or another through electoral fraud, it, it is not good for the system at all. And the same thing has to apply to any Indigenous voice, that it has to have very clear and crisp rules about who the, re who the voice represents and how it comes about that they represent Indigenous peoples at a national or a regional or a local level. Because if you don't have clarity around that, then um, the rules are not clear and the integrity of the institution will be undermined. So a lot of thought has to be given to precisely that question. I'm not sure that it's been fully articulated.
There are many people, in fact, broadly speaking, I'm one of them, who says the Aboriginal people have asked for recognition of their you know, long history in this country uh, and who are good, you know, good-naturedly sort of considering that. It just seems to me that it's a whole new ball game now to propose something that's unknown, be instituted in the or inserted into the Constitution. But the preamble is a different matter. If you had a form of words there that recognised their history, their occupation of the, na- the lands for many years, then went on to say somehow or other that we now all come together as one people with the formal part of the Constitution. Any comments from your perspective uh, uh, on that line of thinking? Yeah, well, the first observation is that several of the state constitutions have done that in their preambles. I didn't recognised know that. Australia's Indigenous history. Yes, they have. Uh, and I mean, I suppose it's a reflection of the, the extent to which we don't pay attention to the states in a way that maybe we should sometimes, yeah. because the state constitution. I plead guilty. Very, uh, well, yeah. it's 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 something that I suppose any constitutional lawyer like me needs to know about. But it, it's very significant, yeah, because um, our state governments are very powerful and significant, as we saw in the middle of COVID, didn't we? So there's no doubt about no doubt about that. I think the other thing is important to say is that. Preambles are very different from the main body of a constitution because the main body of a constitution contains provisions that create institutions, establish them, which confer powers on those institutions or place limits on those powers and protect freedoms and liberties or rights. And so those sorts of provisions are are the effective material of the constitution And it's those provisions that governments and parliaments and judges as well must abide by. And if they fail to, you can take proceedings to a court, the High Court ultimately, to ensure that those rules are followed. A preamble is very different from that. It doesn't contain powers, institutions, rights, controls on power or anything like that. It contains usually a recitation of relevant history, a recitation sometimes of relevant principles, and that's about what it does. And so for that reason, a preamble is not something directly enforced by the courts. You can't say, well, government, you or parliament, you have failed to abide by the preamble. I'm taking action in the court to force you to follow what the preamble says. Preambles do have an effect on interpretation, though, because the Constitution as a document has to be understood by reference to its history and by reference to its underlying principles. And so the courts do take cognizance of what's said in a preamble to, to, um, to shape the interpretation of the Constitution, but only in a very general sense. One has to be careful about what one puts into a preamble, Uh, The preambles of the constitutions of the world are of a great variety and some of them probably go too far in all of the detail they put in. Uh, But the Australian Constitution is like, the the preamble to the Australian Constitution, like the Constitution as a whole, is careful about what it says and clear about the principles that it's articulating. Uh, And it would be possible to insert in principle some recognition of Australia's Indigenous history as part of the story of the nation, uh, which would be due recognition of that history. I think that would be a good thing that that happened. Um, But it wouldn't have the same sort of effect of inserting something into the working document, which would be enforceable by the courts. It's a very big difference between the two. It's my genuine belief then, I have to say this, that the Australian people are entitled to know exactly what this is. I would also say they have a responsibility to involve themselves in the debate before they vote Mm. because it could have enormous ramifications for the country. Uh, And there are a lot of Aboriginal people, including five outstanding Aboriginal people, uh, on the uh, Recognise a Better Way panel uh, that I am serving with as well who do not support it. So I just make that point to, uh, to people. This is a serious issue in the sense that we do have to grapple with those Aboriginal communities that are not doing it well, uh, and it would be inhumane Mm. and un-Australian, if I can use that term, not to take it seriously 
But I do think when you start to play with the Constitution, there is an absolute responsibility on the part of those who propose change and those who have to consider it for the future of their country to know exactly what's involved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Really nice to be here. Thank you, John. Thank you.